Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Alec, I'm the Youth Minister here at HDK. Uh, it's great to be with you all this evening. Uh, I'll pray, and then we'll begin digging into God's Word together. So please. Father, we pray that as we spend this time under your Word, we will be open, we will be ready, we'll be listening, we will allow it to be sharpening us. I pray that as we consider uh, what it means to meet Jesus, what happens when we meet Jesus, I pray that we will make us ask ourselves questions, question each other, sharpen each other, uh, and enjoy what it is to be gifted new life through your son. Amen. Uh, well, I've had uh, a bit of a random thing over the past few weeks that I've been following along with. Uh, for about a month or so, I have been following the saga of the US Powerball. Anyone else here a fan of the US Powerball? Probably not. Um, I really have no interest in lotto or anything in general, uh, but this was unique. Uh, for those of you who don't follow lotteries from countries you don't live in, uh, I will give you the short version. The Powerball is a, a, a national lotto, and ever since January 1st, nobody has won it. So it just keeps on going up and up and up. So after 40 unsuccessful draws, somebody this week finally won what ended up being 1.3 billion US dollars. Uh, which is roughly two billion Australian dollars, right? And something that I have seen stated everywhere is that that is a life-changing amount of money, and which is a common thing to say when somebody wins the lotto, right? And of course, something so big, that will change your life no matter what. Uh, but I've always found that to be a funny way to label things as if it's a big deal, like saying that it is life-changing. Because the more you think about it, the more you would probably realise well, what isn't life-changing, right? $2 billion, of course, that is life-changing. Your new dream job that you've always wanted, right? That is life-changing. When you finally get your license, that is life-changing. When Tom got his electric guitar, life-changing. I'm sure for everyone else in the house as well. When a new item on the McDonald's menu drops, that could be life-changing, right? If it's a good item, you know, it could change your life. Maybe you discover a new brand of undies, that's just life-changing. Sure, it might not be $2 billion, but some things are just as valid when you consider if they change your life. Uh, because our lives are full of events and moments that shape us. Uh, this week, my, my baby son, Carmelo, he sprouted his first couple teeth. Uh, he's already fallen on his, chi uh, on his chin and he's bit his lip and he's bleeding everywhere. His life has changed this week. He's got all set, a new set of things to look out for. His life's constantly changing. Uh, but as our lives change and change over the years, eventually it just stops, doesn't it? When life ends, it doesn't matter how many changes you went through, how many billions of dollars you might have won, life changing does not last. And it's an idea that I often think about because ever since a few years ago, I heard one of my friends give his testimony, uh, his story of how he met Jesus. Uh, and in it, he described the gospel as God's eternity-changing news. You know, he specified that, that God doesn't change our lives. He changes our eternity by giving us his son. And that's really stuck with me. I've reflected on that a few times over the years and, and come to appreciate more and more that God's plan for us wasn't to change or fix our lives, but to give us new life to gift us with a new eternity. You know, but how do you change in eternity? If $2 billion won't do it, what would? You know, not just to change a life, but everything, forever. Well, the first thing we want to figure out tonight is the change itself, right? So what are we being changed from and what into? The change that God brings is a change from eternity that follows a life of sin. Right? We're all sinners. We are ones who have constantly chosen darkness of a life without God. And so we deserve to be handed over to that darkness, facing God's judgment, his wrath, the eternity of separation from the creator that we have chosen. Right? Hell. And so the thing that we are changed from, we go from that to an eternity with God. Eternity of life, entry into God's kingdom entry into heaven from death to life hell to heaven eternal judgment to eternal joy within the kingdom of god 
So how do we get it? This is a huge change. How do we get it? If you're someone who is still pondering what Jesus is on about, uh, maybe you've been coming along to church your entire life, you should still be asking yourself, no matter what, over these coming weeks, have I met Jesus? If not, do I want to? Why should I want to? And if I have, what has it changed about my life? More specifically tonight, what has it changed about my eternity? And our passage begins with a man named Nicodemus. Uh, he, as he meets Jesus, right? Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so a teacher of the Jewish people, the ones who upheld God's word and his teachings. Uh, in large part, they were the ones who were threatened by and in turn tried to get rid of Jesus. Nicodemus, however, at the very least, seems to understand that Jesus was sent by God. He addresses him in verse 2 as a teacher whose actions, so his teachings, his signs, his miracles, those things are proof that he's from God. So maybe he hasn't clued in the fact that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. He at least knows that Jesus knows what he's talking about. Uh, and in this greeting, Nicodemus is actually making somewhat of an inquiry of Jesus, a request to sort of hear a little bit more about what Jesus is on about. And that's something that Jesus is always happy to oblige. Uh, so from verse 3, uh, follow along with me in the passage. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Uh, interesting, right? Confusing even. Certainly was for Nicodemus. Uh, to be able to see the kingdom, that sounds amazing. But to do it, you need to be born again. Uh, and Nicodemus, he's confused and seemed, you know, he takes it quite literally, right? Verse 4, how can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Uh, which is an interesting image, to say the least. Uh, for those uh, in this room who have seen a baby be born, I'm sure that you'd most likely agree it looked hard enough to begin with the first time around. And that was with a tiny version of a person, let alone the full-size thing. And for those in this room who have experienced childbirth, well, then you would definitely agree that it was hard enough the first time around. Uh, it might be easy for us to laugh at Nicodemus being confused here. Maybe if we were in that situation, we would have been, you know, been a bit smarter. Go, oh, obviously, Jesus is he's using a metaphor. This is an analogy. Uh, but like Nicodemus, we'd be wrong too. Because Jesus isn't using a metaphor. The birth he's talking about, it is a real birth just like that of a newborn. Nicodemus is, of course, off a bit on locations and meanings of things, but Jesus lovingly puts him and us on track with what he's talking about. He even humours Nicodemus a bit. He explains that even if someone was going to go and rebirth themselves physically, not only would that be kind of weird and gross, of course, but it would be totally useless. Because just like when we're all born the first time, a physical birth leads to a physical life. And in the same way, a spiritual birth, well, that gives way to a spiritual life. This rebirth, it's not one of flesh, not a physical birth, but it is still a real and impactful spiritual birth. And this spiritual rebirth, it's not just some, you know, really good thing, right? It's not simply a revitalization of, a, of sorts, but rather it's a necessity Jesus says in verse 4 that unless you are born again in this way, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't have that eternity-changing gift from God. You know, the term born-again Christian, I'm sure many of us have heard it, it's, it's come to sort of represent a certain type of typically American Christian language, right? But to be born again of the Spirit, it is incredibly valuable. According to Jesus, it is a necessity to be born again. Because only those who are spiritually born again, those who receive life, they are the ones who can enter God's kingdom. Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 6 that he shouldn't be surprised. Uh, the reason being that in the Old Testament, in the Jewish teachings, this was a familiar idea. Uh, the Old Testament it wouldn't use the term giving birth, right? But our Ezekiel passage that we just read earlier, it uses the language of God giving us new hearts and putting his spirit into us, transforming us so that we would be a people who will do his will and be gathered as his nation. 
This language is exactly what Jesus has in mind as he describes the new life granted when we're born again by the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to transform us into God's people, to help us as we meet Jesus to then be transformed and receive new life. And that work of the Spirit, same as I said earlier, it is not a metaphor or an illustration. It is very much a real eternity-changing rebirth. In fact, Jesus now uses an illustration to help us understand the reality of the Spirit's work, comparing the wind with someone born of the Spirit. Uh, From verse 8, read with me, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Uh, What's going on here? At the first glance, it feels like one of Jesus' classic riddles. It's just there to confuse us. And in fact, Nicodemus is confused still. But the comparison here is that the wind, something real, something that leaves a clear mark on the world, something that while we can see its results and live accordingly, is also something that we can't see or manipulate. You know, if you've ever been at a campfire and, you know, the smoke just follows you around no matter where you decide to stand around the fire, you'd know that that's true. The wind is a mysterious thing and it flows independently of us as mere humans. And it's the same for the birth of, it's the same for the birth of people through the Spirit. Spiritual birth, it is real, it leaves a clear mark on those it touches and it is not controlled or predictable to humans. It blows where it pleases, just like the wind, and is unavoidable, and yet at the same time, impossible to pin down. Its results can be seen and felt by all. What's the point of that? Jesus is telling Nicodemus, he's telling us that spiritual rebirth, it's a real thing. A force of nature, almost, that can be seen via what it does. And it's a necessity anyone that wants to enter the kingdom if you want your eternity to be changed for the better well then you need to be born again you need to receive new life and this is something that Nicodemus he doesn't seem to understand quite yet and Jesus responds by calling out that you know this isn't just a random guy off the street but he is a teacher of God's people Jesus is talking about things that God has already shown to his people in the past things that Nicodemus should know about, and yet he just doesn't get it. And it's because he hasn't received new life yet. He hasn't been reborn. What does Nicodemus need to do? What do we need to do? How can someone receive this new life? How do I see and be able to enter the kingdom of God? We need to meet Jesus. Uh, and not simply encounter him or be familiar with what he's on about. Nicodemus, he's not quite there yet because he hasn't actually met Jesus for who he is, the one who came down from heaven, the one who is in fact God himself, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. That's who you need to meet, not just a rabbi or a teacher, a prophet, a wise man from another time or a generally good bloke. You need to meet the Son of God. That's how you receive eternity-changing rebirth. And then Jesus explains to us what it looks like to truly meet him, right? He refers to when Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. And what he's talking about here is the events of Numbers chapter 1 in the Old Testament. The Israelites, they had been rebelling against God. uh, And in judgment of their rebellion, God has sent venomous snakes out amongst them which seems like we've just randomly jumped into a really grim part of the Bible. But this is actually a wonderful turning point in the book of Numbers because the Israelites realize their mistake. They pray to God for forgiveness and God, who has condemned them to death, provides them a way to have life instead. From verse 8 of Numbers 21, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Uh, God's response here, it is a few things, right? Firstly, it's a bit odd. 
kind of funny in a way, actually. If you've been bitten by a snake, well, what's the one thing you want to look at? How about another snake? But also, it's a chance for his people to trust him, to listen to his words and believe them. More importantly, it is a chance to look to him as the only way to receive life. His promise is that if you look where he tells you to look, you will live. And it's something that everyone can do. It didn't require a priest to intercede for them. It it didn't require a certain level of knowledge of God's word so that you could, you know, comprehend the full details of what's going on. You don't even need to physically get up and go touch the snake. Just trust his word, look to him, and receive life. To those who choose to live in light of God's promise and to look to the snake, God grants them life. This is actually one of my favourite parts of the Bible. Uh, And a big reason for that is the ridiculousness of the bronze snake and just how brilliant that ridiculousness is. Imagine being from any other nation, right, and you get to just sort of, if you're able to sit back and watch this scene play out. The Israelites would have seemed foolish. They were a bunch of idiots staring at a snake on a pole. But to the Israelites, they get it. They're looking in the right place. And Jesus is saying in John chapter 3, it is the same. That if you want to receive new life, if you want your eternity to be changed from condemnation to eternal joy, then you need to look where God is telling you to look. Look to Jesus, the one who was raised up on the cross. Meet him on the cross where he died for us all to then rise and offer you the gift of new life. When you meet him, when you look to him, trust his words and do as he says. Then you'll get it. You won't be able to take your eyes off him. Your eternity will be changed, but only if you look. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those who haven't met Jesus, who don't trust that he's the son of God, who died on the cross as atonement for our sins, to those people, well, we're just a bunch of idiots staring at a guy on a cross. It's ridiculous, right? There's no medical, scientific or logical reason behind it. There's no reason to look at the cross and expect Jesus to grant you the gift of spiritual rebirth into a new life unless you trust God's promise that he has done it. Unless you trust that God's love for each and every one of us came in the form of his son who we could meet, who could bring us the spirit that would give new life to us all. It is a loving and eternity-changing act, seen perfectly in perhaps the most famous words of the Bible, from verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God's love is shown through Jesus. And most people will probably be familiar with this passage in some regard, right? But let's actually take a proper look at it together. God loves us. He loves us so much that he wanted to change our eternity a people who rejected him, right? Who earned for themselves an eternity without him, people who are doomed to perish. He loves them. He didn't seek to change our lives, to make the world around us better. Just look around at the world. You don't have to look far, whether it's the Middle East in our own lives, in the eastern suburbs just yesterday. This world is broken. God doesn't try to fix the world or fix our lives because he doesn't want us to have good lives. God's desire for the ones he loves isn't a life of luxuries, good grades, successful careers, the approval of our peers. That's not to say throw away the gifts God has blessed you with. They are good gifts from him. 
but to seek out the gifts and the gifts alone. It's pointless. It's like trying to be reborn again physically. It's useless. God's desire, what he wants for you, the one he loves, isn't a good life, but an eternal one. The only life that lasts and has real value is the new and eternal one that God can offer. And so he did. He gave you his only son. He gave you himself to be hung on a cross so that you would be able to be born again. Not by sinful flesh this time, but by the spirit of God. Those who haven't met him, who haven't looked up to where God says to look, well, they don't get it. As verse 18 puts it, they stand condemned. Their eternity, it hasn't changed, and without new life, they're doomed to death. If you think that that's you, or if you think that that is somebody you know or love, well, then let me encourage you. Please encourage them. Look to Jesus. When you look to the Son of Man, when you meet Jesus, when you read about him in the Bible and keep reading and keep listening, keep learning and growing, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, it changes your eternity. And eternity doesn't mean when you eventually pass away or when Jesus returns. Eternity is now. You are reborn now. How do you know if you've really met Jesus? Well, what's different about your life? How do you know if you have been born again of the Spirit? Well, do you keep looking to Jesus as you live? Do you keep taking in what he says, not just as wise words, but as God's words? The best and only way to live. How do you know if you have received new and eternal life? You know because God says you have. Has meeting Jesus made you more loving of your neighbours, to your brothers and sisters at church? Maybe through little things like just trying to be at church on time so it's not awkward for for new people or random things like offering to pray for each other even when there's actually not much going on. Or in the big things like trying to help each other understand and look towards Jesus together, sharpening each other because we know looking to him is the only way we will enter the kingdom of God. Has meeting Jesus affected which job or degree you're going to chase after? Has it affected which postcode you want to live in? What you decide to do with the money or with the things that you've been entrusted with? And there's no single right answer or action to take. But has your meeting with Jesus factored in at all? Can you see the results of the new life you've been given by meeting Jesus? Or maybe you're wondering if you actually have met Jesus. Well, if that's the case, pay close attention to verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. If you haven't met Jesus, if you want to, if you have, but you still need to keep looking to him, well, then it is simple. Live according to the truth. Live life according to what Jesus says and it will light the way for you. It's an encouragement for all of us, no matter where we feel like we stand, as we keep on looking to him, keep on relying on the light of God to see Jesus clearly. When you can see Jesus clearly, you can meet him for who he is. When you meet Jesus, well, then you receive new life, life eternal, with your place in God's kingdom secured. So let's encourage each other, push each other to look up, to do as God commands and trust him. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for Christ, for the gift of new life that you sent to us. I pray that as we look to him, we will look to him alone. We won't seek anything other than the grace that you have offered through Jesus Christ. Amen.